I'm John Strum, and this is Real Talk MS. It's April 27th, and we have a lot to talk about. In the United States, COVID-19 vaccines were in the news this past week. The CDC and FDA paused the distribution of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, and while that situation has already been resolved, it made a lot of folks who were already nervous about being vaccinated more nervous about being vaccinated. Also this past week, President Biden announced that 200 million Americans had received a COVID-19 vaccine. At the same time, polling shows that a significant percentage of the people who haven't yet been vaccinated are taking a wait-and-see attitude about the COVID-19 vaccines, and somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of the adults in America have decided that they won't be getting a COVID-19 vaccination which means that our country won't be getting back to life as we once knew it anytime soon. Vaccine hesitancy is certainly understandable. The entire world has experienced a year that no one could have ever imagined. It's been a frightening experience for a lot of people. And to the millions of families around the world who lost a loved one, being forced to grieve that kind of loss and isolation has been unbearable. So approaching new things, especially new things associated with the COVID-19 virus, well, it's just scary for a lot of people. Joining me today to talk about all the things about the COVID-19 vaccines that are concerning to people is Dr. Dorlin Kimbrough. Dr. Kimbrough is a neurologist in the Multiple Sclerosis and Neuroimmunology Division at Duke Health. He's an assistant professor of neurology at Duke University School of Medicine, And Dr. Kimbrough is a member of the National MS Society's COVID Vaccine Guidance Task Force. We'll be talking about what all of the concern over the Johnson & Johnson vaccine was about, why it's safe and necessary for people living with MS to be vaccinated, what those vaccination side effects are all about, and how you should be thinking about being vaccinated if you're also taking MS disease-modifying therapies. But before we get to my conversation with Dr. Dorlin Kimbrough, there are a few other things that you should know about. There's some positive news on the horizon for people living with progressive MS. The International Progressive MS Alliance's Scientific Steering Committee reviewed proposals from around the world that were submitted for funding through the Challenges in Progressive MS Awards. These are small pilot awards of 75,000 euro for 12 to 18 month proof of concept research projects that are intended to uncover mechanisms causing progression to identify new treatments for progressive MS. The Alliance plans to fund up to 20 projects and plans to announce the recipients of the awards this summer. So we'll stay tuned for updates. And there's some good news for people living with relapsing remitting MS in the United Kingdom. Kesimpta has been approved for use by the NHS for people living in England and Wales with active relapsing remitting MS. Kesimpta is a so-called B-cell depleting therapy that works in a similar way to Ocrevus, but instead of getting an infusion, Kesimpta is self-injected under the skin. The first three injections are taken weekly, and then future injections are administered once a month. In clinical trials for relapsing remitting MS, Kesimpta reduced the risk of relapse by 50 to 59% compared to Obagio. Kesimpta was also shown to reduce disability progression and the number of lesions seen on MRI scans. Last week, the American Academy of Neurology held their annual meeting virtually. And during the meeting, outcomes of a number of interesting research studies were announced. We'll be talking about some of these studies in greater detail in future podcast episodes, but I wanted to share some of the news announced at the AAN annual meeting. 
I'm sure you can imagine how helpful it would be if doctors could predict disability worsening in MS before it actually happened. Knowing this kind of information could better inform treatment options while tailoring treatment to a specific patient who is looking at a specific disease course ahead. This approach to diagnosis and treatment is sometimes referred to as personalized or precision medicine. And an international research team reported that measuring two proteins in the blood of people living with non-active secondary progressive MS could be predictive of worsening disability. The two proteins are neurofilament light chain, or NFL, which is a potential biomarker that we've actually discussed frequently on previous podcast episodes, and glial fibrillary acidic protein, or GFAP. This research involved analyzing blood samples from over a 1,000 people with MS and calculating the amount of time it took a study participant to achieve a one-point worsening in their EDSS score. EDSS, or Expanded Disability Status Scale, is used universally as a measure of disability in MS. And this work is actually part of a larger study that we'll be hearing more about over the coming year. Another study presented at the American Academy of Neurology annual meeting examined the socio-demographic and clinical characteristics of people with MS by race and ethnicity. This research team analyzed data from the North American Registry for Care and Research in Multiple Sclerosis, a physician-based registry with health and demographic data on MS patients between the ages of 18 and 50 in the United States and Canada. And for this study, the team looked at the characteristics of 722 people who were added to the registry between 2016 and mid-2020. Of the 695 patients living in the United States, 84% were white, 11% were black, and about a quarter were ethnically Hispanic. The amount of time between symptom onset and diagnosis of MS was comparable between black and white patients. The two groups had similar levels of education, but unemployment rates among black patients was more than double that of white patients. The study also showed that black MS patients were significantly more likely to have an annual income of less than $15,000 compared with white patients, and income rates were lowest among black Hispanics compared to other racial or ethnic groups. Overall, most patients in this study had mild disability. 73% of the study participants had an EDSS score of 2.5 or lower. However, the rate of substantial disability, and that would be defined as an EDSS score of 4.0 or higher, was more than twice as high among blacks with relapsing remitting MS than among whites. 57% of the study participants were being treated by disease-modifying therapies. However, disease-modifying therapy use was significantly lower among Hispanics and lowest among black Hispanics. So the real-world data collected from this study indicates that black people living with MS present with more disability than white American patients. Black people living with MS with similar disease status and education were twice as likely to be unemployed compared with white American patients, and more Hispanics living with MS are not receiving treatment with disease-modifying therapies compared to non-Hispanics. These are sobering results, and they serve as a reminder that while an MS diagnosis is hardly good news for anyone, there are members of vulnerable minority populations who deal with some of the worst outcomes when it comes to living with MS. Now, both of these studies were presented during the poster session of the AAN annual meeting, and if you'd like to review the details presented on the posters, you'll find links in today's show notes. As I mentioned at the top of this podcast episode, 
Last week was not only a busy week with the American Academy of Neurology annual meeting taking place, but it was also a week that found COVID-19 vaccines in the news for a variety of different reasons. With 200 million Americans already vaccinated, public health officials in the United States are turning their focus to overcoming vaccine hesitancy. When I've talked to people, I've found that vaccine hesitancy is often based on someone getting a hold of bad information and believing that it's true. Joining me in a moment to talk about what you really do need to know about the COVID-19 vaccines, their side effects, and their interactions with MS disease-modifying therapies is my guest, Dr. Dorlin Kimbrough. My guest today is Dr. Dorlin Kimbrough. Dr. Kimbrough is a neurologist in the Multiple Sclerosis and Neuroimmunology Division at Duke Health. He's an assistant professor of neurology at Duke University School of Medicine. And Dr. Kimbrough is a member of the National MS Society's COVID Vaccine Guidance Task Force. This is the group of experts convened by the MS Society to develop guidance for people living with MS so that you can make informed decisions about the safety, efficacy, and the timing of COVID-19 vaccines with certain disease-modifying therapies. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Kimbrough. Thanks, John. Good to be here. You know, at the moment, the CDC and FDA have paused the use of the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, although that pause may very well be lifted before this podcast episode is available four days from now. I think it's still worth talking about because it's made some people nervous about being vaccinated in a more general sense. Now, the reason for the pause in distributing the J&J vaccine was to give experts time to investigate an extremely rare blood clotting issue. So can you explain a little bit about what this condition is and, and tell me how serious is it? So I'll say the name of it once. It's a mouthful. It's called cerebral venous sinus thrombosis, but which is a, a fancy way of saying that these are um, blood clots that occur in the veins of the brain. And uh, it can be very serious. Sometimes they're associated with hemorrhage or, or damage to the brain itself. And uh, it's uh, very important that anybody that has related symptoms, such as severe headache, um, sometimes seizures, new and unusual symptoms get evaluated, but fortunately it's quite rare. And how common is it for someone to experience this condition after receiving the vaccine? And and how does that compare with how common it might be for someone who didn't receive the vaccine to experience the same condition? So there were six cases of this out of uh, nearly 7 million doses of the vaccine administered. So exceedingly rare. And in the general population, there are about five cases of this per million individuals. So again, in both cases, quite rare. The point of the pause was to just make sure that this is not something that uh, is uh, more frequent um, with closer scrutiny. And are people living with MS at greater risk for this particular condition if they happen to receive the J&J vaccine? No, there's not a particularly greater risk uh, associated with having uh, MS for this condition. Well, I appreciate you clarifying a situation that I know has some people alarmed. So let's focus our conversation on the two mRNA vaccines, the vaccines from Pfizer, BioNTech, and Moderna, to repeat something we've heard often on the podcast, but I believe can't be said often enough. Are these two vaccines safe for people living with MS? Yes, yes, and yes. These vaccines are safe. Uh, They have been vetted, and uh, they are um, available for use. And does the MS Society's COVID Vaccine Guidance Task Force recommend one vaccine over another for people living with MS? There is not a preference in terms of which particular vaccine. Uh, In general, it's important to get the first uh, vaccine opportunity that becomes available. So assuming, and I'm hoping that I'm assuming correctly, that some people listening are going to take that exact advice and get the first vaccine that's available to them, what are some of the common side effects that people may experience after getting vaccinated? So it's pretty common to experience some 
pain or soreness at the injection site. There may be fatigue. There may be muscle aches in general. Uh, some people describe it as a, a bit like having the flu, but uh, without all the, the respiratory symptoms that go along with that. Um, so it, it would not be uh, unusual to experience mild symptoms like that lasting for a few days after the vaccine. And will people who are living with MS experience the same sort of side effects as the general population? In general, yes. Some people are worried reasonably that having a vaccine may cause them to have uh, more symptoms related to MS. Uh, it's not necessarily the case that this could cause a flare of MS, although coincidentally, sometimes it does happen. Fortunately, we're not seeing a higher rate of relapses after vaccination than otherwise uh, would happen. You know, we've heard a lot in the news about COVID-19 variants from South Africa, the UK, and elsewhere. Are the two mRNA vaccines effective against these known variants? Yes, there have been studies looking at the efficacy against various variants, and uh, they are effective. Drilling down a little bit now, what can you tell us about the safety of getting an mRNA vaccine while someone is on an MS disease-modifying therapy? So in terms of safety, essentially no concern there. I mean, you're getting the vaccine is safe with treatment, and the question that comes up more often is whether or not the vaccine itself will be effective if someone is on in immune system modifying uh, medication? And uh, the answer to that is generally yes. There are some studies where you can look at uh, vaccine responses for other conditions for people that are using medications for MS. And even in those cases where the, the vaccine titers or measurements of their effectiveness, even if there are cases where those are a little bit lower than for someone who's not taking treatments for MS, the, the levels are still adequate for protection. And so we expect there to still be efficacy. I've noticed, uh, unfortunately, a huge number of posts and even online videos from people who are receiving one of the B-cell depleting therapies to manage their MS. And these are people who have been vaccinated. And when they've been tested for COVID antibodies, they haven't developed any. Now, is this because they're disease-modifying therapy, this B-cell depleting therapy is impacting their ability to develop COVID-19 antibodies? That's certainly a possibility. It also depends on when those antibodies uh, were tested for in relationship to the, uh, the, the timing of the vaccine too. Um, and so for managing situations like that, it's important to work with the uh, a uh, neurologist or any other members of the healthcare team there and, and look at the timing of the vaccine and the antibody testing afterwards and then the uh, response uh, to that. And uh, it remains to be seen uh, whether or to what extent people will get uh, additional doses of vaccines and boosters and whatnot. Um, right now, the main public health thrust has been to get as many uh, people vaccinated as possible and sort of the, uh, I guess, second helpings, if you will, we'll kind of uh, revisit that on a rolling basis as it becomes necessary. So what should people who are currently on B-cell depleting therapy be thinking about? What do they need to be doing to make sure they're staying safe during this time? So in general, it's important to continue to follow the CDC guidelines within reason here. Uh, and I say within reason in, in, in that, I, I guess I should just say follow the guidelines to be specific about that. But there's been some talk lately about uh, under what circumstances can people gather in small groups? Under what circumstances can you travel and things like that? And even though there are these general guidance documents and press releases, given that B-cell therapy is immunomodulating and um, people have different responses to it, the most conservative way to go about it would be to continue to take precautions. And if there are going to be deviations from that, then to have a conversation with your doctor about your particular circumstance and what your B cell counts look like and what your past medical history has been like and all those sorts of things to try to make a reasonable decision. 
Over the past couple of days, as we've seen 200 million Americans already vaccinated, we've also heard that there's still a sizable percentage of people who are taking a wait-and-see attitude about being vaccinated, and somewhere between 15 and 20 percent of Americans are saying flat out that they won't get vaccinated. As a country, we really can't fully get back to work or anything resembling the life we once knew until that situation improves. So let's talk about some of the common concerns that people living with MS and and people not living with MS all seem to have. Some people are worried about long-term side effects from the vaccine. What does the available evidence tell us? So thus far, we don't have a lot of evidence about uh, major problems that we expect from these vaccines. Again, it's been very recently that we just started uh, administering the vaccines, but Thus far, we don't have data on that that's being collected, and we don't see uh, really an immediate uh, uh, concern on that front. You actually started to answer this question already. Some people living with MS are worried that getting vaccinated will trigger a relapse. Can the vaccine cause a relapse, or is it more like what some people refer to as a pseudo-relapse? Right, so we talked a bit about... uh, the side effects that can accompany vaccination to begin with. And certainly if someone already has a chronic medical condition like MS, then maybe um, some of the old symptoms can, uh, can be brought out by that sometimes under those circumstances, or people may feel a little bit more of, let's say numbness or tingling or pain or things like that. And anytime you challenge the immune system, it is possible that people could experience more symptoms That said, it's important to get that checked out if someone experiences more symptoms because there's a difference in what we call, as you mentioned, pseudo flares versus a true flare up of MS and whether or not that's accompanied by um, changes on the MRI scans or changes in the examination that a neurologist would do. So if something like that were to happen, it's important to get it evaluated. Some people are nervous because they see mRNA technology as being new, and they worry that the vaccines are so new, we still don't know whether they're safe. What can you tell us about this mRNA uh, technology that's being used for these vaccines and the safety of these particular vaccines? So again, I definitely just want to emphasize the safety here. The the mRNA vaccine, that's a mechanism of of uh, having the vaccine work. It's a way of getting a message into immune system cells to create immunity against the virus that causes COVID-19 without introducing the virus itself. It just uh, creates what's called a spike protein. This little piece of the virus allows the body to recognize it and then fight it off. And the mRNA mRNA technology is a great in terms of the way it allowed the production of the vaccines to be sped up. And when there's a global crisis like a pandemic, it's important, obviously, to speed up the production to be able to get this out to the public. And so um, in some ways, it's a big achievement to have this technology come to the front in an emergency to be used to deliver a safe and effective vaccine. I've heard from people in the research community that they're looking forward to testing this mRNA delivery platform for other vaccines. So this may really usher in a new phase in terms of vaccine protocols well beyond COVID-19. Yep, I've heard that as well. And and frankly, the the mRNA vaccine uh, science you know that had been in, in research for for years, so it's not, it's it's new to the public in a way, but it's not new to scientists who have known about this technology. It's just sort of become mainstream and employed in an emergency, and now it's in everyone's uh, news feeds and uh, and and people are hearing about it. But the the idea behind this has been around for a while. Uh, So just to complete the checklist of concerns that are out there being being, uh, talked about, discussed, posted on social media and the like, can the COVID-19 vaccines alter someone's DNA? No, flat out no. (laughs) Can they cause infertility in women? No. Do they carry dangerous toxins into our systems? They do not. That sounded like a lot, but... 
there's a lot of misinformation or opinion masquerading as fact out there, so I really appreciate you taking the time to clarify some of that. Vaccine hesitancy has been particularly apparent in underserved minority communities, and the sad irony is that these are the same communities that have been hit the hardest by COVID-19 with higher rates of hospitalization and higher mortality rates. Distrust of a healthcare system that hasn't been particularly equitable is understandable. Over time, I'm hopeful we can collectively work to fix the systemic inequities that exist, but that's not going to be an overnight fix. Right now, We're still seeing over 50,000 COVID-19 cases diagnosed in the U.S. every day. Yesterday, more than 700 people died from COVID-19 in the United States. So while the necessary and important work of correcting healthcare inequities gets underway, what can be done to address the vaccine hesitancy that we're seeing today so that more lives can be saved and more families can be kept whole? So... Some of the hesitancy is about fear, which is understandable when there is a pandemic and that's frightening by itself. And then all of a sudden there is a a vaccine available and it has uh, new technology used to make it work. And uh, all these things are understandably frightening. And I think that the more we can combat the disinformation and, and have people uh, understand that the vaccines are truly safe and effective, that, that's a big step. People who have had the vaccine already can also be um, sources of uh, um, reassurance for people that haven't gotten the vaccine yet. You can talk to people who've had the experience and they're, they're doing well. Another aspect of, uh, of handling this, uh, unfortunately, has been that many people um, have sadly had the experience of uh, knowing friends or family or others who have had the worst uh, um, outcomes with COVID-19 or been hospitalized in the ICU or in some cases have even um, died from COVID-19. And when you weigh concerns about the vaccine against the, the devastation that it's, that it's brought, um, sometimes that's uh, um, a really stark reminder of how important it is to, to go forward with the, uh, with the vaccine. Also to um, you know, there are some places where there are uh, vaccines available to, to, to get, but there may be hesitancy in communities where you have um, people coming from outside that community to, to drive there and get the vaccine because they know that it's, it's available there. So I think it's really important for people to take advantage of the opportunities that they have at their local community, whether it's a clinic, pharmacy, healthcare center, what have you and uh, really just make an effort to get vaccinated both for themselves and for the people around them. I I think those are all excellent, really important observations as well. I have a friend who is fond of saying, sooner or later, the truth takes over. And I can't help but feel when I think about some of the uh, stuff that's being posted online, being shared, that just has no basis in reality. At, At some point, I think you have to step back and say, Well, 200 million people in our country have already gotten shots in arms. Now, if there was a real problem, we'd probably be hearing about it. Even when there was a statistically tiny problem with the Johnson & Johnson vaccine, such a great example of what happened as soon as the smallest irregularity was identified, right? Exactly, exactly. So, I think sometimes, um, and, and earlier you asked me several questions about different myths, and I, I just gave you flat out answers of no, no, and no, I think to those, and uh, I stand by those <laughs> answers. But I also don't want to be uh, completely dismissive of people's fear and anxieties about the vaccine and about this whole situation, because um, it's easy to say, you know, that a particular myth or conspiracy theory or whatever you want to call it just sounds like a like it, that it sounds ridiculous when you compare it to science and so forth. But I think for some people underneath that is simply fear, which is understandable. And so I think acknowledging fear, which can be dealt with and understood and, and you can talk about why there's fear and handle that. I think that's, that's important because then we don't have to kind of cut through the, 
the middleman of misinformation and myths and other things that are brought in to justify what's just a natural fear of the unknown. Well, Dr. Dorlin Kimbrough, I want to thank you for all that you do to improve the lives of people affected by MS. And thanks for talking with me today. Thank you. I appreciate the time. That's going to wrap up this episode of Real Talk MS. Real Talk MS is powered by the National MS Society. And you can share this episode of the podcast by letting your friends or family members know that all they have to do is point their web browser at realtalkms.com slash 191. You'll find that link in today's show notes, so you can easily copy and paste it right into an email or text. And now I have a favor to ask. It would mean a lot to me if you'd leave a rating and review for Real Talk MS. Just point your web browser at realtalkms.com slash review and you'll see links to the different online destinations that you can choose from to leave that rating and review. And those links are going to be different for each of you because they're actually based upon the software that you happen to be using to listen to podcasts or the software that you at least have installed on your phone, tablet, or desktop computer. For example, if you happen to be using an Android phone to listen to Real Talk MS, you won't see a link to leave a rating and review on Apple Podcasts because you can't leave a review on Apple Podcasts if you're using an Android phone. I hope that makes sense. It's just a little bit of technology that makes leaving a rating and review super easy. So if you're able, I hope you'll take just a moment to leave a rating and review for Real Talk MS, and you'll find a link to do that in today's show notes. I'm John Strum. Thanks for listening. Stay safe and make healthy choices.